and you're very welcome to episode 16 of The Fifth Court, a podcast on legal affairs presented by myself, Peter Leonard Barrister. And myself, Mark Tottenham, Barrister and editor of Decisis.ie. Sweet 16, Mark, who would have thought? Exactly. Yeah, it's great. Time isn't flies. It? Great. Well, look, good as always to see you. And we have to give a little message on behalf of our sponsor, which we're very grateful for. This is, of course, Practice Evolve Software, combining document management and accounting software, offering law firms a holistic practice management solution built with lawyers in mind. Well, last week, you will recall, we had a fascinating interview with Barrister and Sunday newspaper editor Ted Harding. We got a great response to that. And indeed, one of the authors he mentioned, Dominic Carmen, son of the great George Carmen, libel lawyer extraordinaire, was on straight away to express delight that his book got a mention. Indeed, yeah. Isn't that good, Mark? Yeah, absolutely. So we have we're, international we're, listenership. Exactly. It, it's, 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 it, that's, I thought that was really cool. Well, on today's show, we are ter- returning to the ivory towers of academia. And after our very enjoyable visit to UCC, we are now heading to the equally leafy campus of Maynooth University for today's guest, Dr. Neil Maddox. Uh, and given the background with COVID-19 pandemics and all that sort of stuff, we thought we would talk to Neil about vaccination and the law. It's an area that he has written on and given a series of lectures on and we thought it was really interesting. Uh, apparently there's an anti-vax movement back in the 19th century, Mark. Indeed, Did you know yeah, that? Well, yeah. we're going to find all about that. Uh, but before we get to that stage, we're going to discuss three cases which you have identified from the Decisis website. The first case today concerns a European arrest, arrest warrant. Uh, this is the case of the Minister for Justice versus Corte, a decision of the High Court uh, and Ms. Justice Stack in the High Court. And this was a case where the German authorities had issued a warrant warrant for an individual who had been convicted of swindling, I believe, swindling and fraud. However, Judge Stack... I think I should just clarify, he had not been convicted. He was he was uh, suspected and was due for trial on the... That's why I love working with you, Mark. You're such a lawyer. That's very good. Well, anyway, Judge Stack wasn't happy with the paperwork that the Germans provided. Exactly. So what happened, I think we were discussing a, 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 a European arrest warrant pro, uh, case in the last programme, and I just described it as a tick box exercise. Um, and very often, once all of the the boxes are ticked, effectively the the Irish courts have to surrender the the person in question to the other country. What happened here was the person had already been surrendered to Germany, but they wanted to try him on other charges. Now you might think that once he's already arrived in Germany, they can do what they like with him. But the but under the European legislation, it's actually necessary to go back to the original country um, of origin and get a further European arrest warrant in relation to the. Further the charges. If there are additional charges. If there are additional okay. charges, exactly. And that's what seems to have happened in this case. Um, the problem was that the, the one of the boxes that needs to be ticked is that the, it, that the European arrest warrant is supposed to have been issued by the appropriate um, judicial authority in the issuing state, whereas in fact it was issued by a German public prosecutor. Now you might ask, well, how could a public prosecutor ever be a judicial authority? But in civil law countries, the the, the, the distinction isn't quite as clear as it would yes. be in a common law country because the judges tend to have an investigative role. But in any event, um, as Justice Stack in this case was not satisfied that the um, that the public prosecutor was the was appropriate a judge, ju- basically, was yeah. a judge, yeah, yeah, and okay. therefore it had to go back. To Very the, good. Okay, the, let's move on to another case where the court found that seventy five thousand euros recorded in a bank account was the proceeds of crime. There had been some uncertainty about this. This is the case of the Criminal Assets Bureau versus Whelan, a decision of Ms. Justice Butler. Uh, And the bank account seems to have emerged following a raid on a hotel room by members of the Garda National Drugs and Organised Crime Unit. Yeah, so what happened was that the the, the raid happened in a hotel room that was occupied by this person and somebody else. And as you know, the Criminal Assets Bureau is there effectively as as another weapon in the fight against organised crime. So instead of people, so where where it's believed that property is the proceeds of crime, the civil standard of proof is, is used in order to, um, to, to, to establish whether or not it should be seized. Um, so was the issue here, I mean, there's a bank account, it records 75,000 exactly. euros. Who knows where that came from? Maybe it's legit. Well, that, that's exactly what happens. Effectively, there is a, there's a reversal of the burden of proof where if the guards are able to say convincingly to the court that, that the person has been involved in, in organised crime, that then the, the burden of proof shifts onto that person to yes. show where the money so came from. So that's the legal test. And that was the issue. And the, 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 in, in this case... 
uh, both in the High Court and then again on appeal, they tried to argue that there was an injustice involved in seizing the €75,000, but the Court of Appeal was satisfied that the test had been met and therefore... So the, Miss they, Justice Butler said this is the proceeds of crime. Indeed, she was happy yeah, that that had yeah. been satisfied. Exactly. Okay, very good. So finally today, we have the case of the Medical Council versus B, and this concerned an application in the High Court to suspend the registration of a doctor who'd been found guilty of certain road traffic offences. Exactly. Uh, the issue in this case was whether the doctor in this case should be anonymised or identified. Uh, Mr Justice David Barnival, President of the High Court, found that on balance he should be identified. The application was taken by Media House, the publisher in this instance of the Sunday World. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 doctor in this case had been had been before the district court on road traffic offences and had pleaded guilty. Um, he then uh, he, he he pleaded guilty and his he, and then appealed the sentence to the circuit court. Um, as happens in relation to many um, professions, the medical council then brought st- uh, sought to uh, suspend his registration because he'd been involved in in criminal activity or he'd been convicted of criminal offence, and therefore. Um, the matter was going before the Medical Council and the media were naturally in- interested. I think there'd been some coverage already of the um, uh, of the, the criminal proceedings. Um, and so the application, as you say, was made by Media House and Mr Justice Barneville held that it was in the public interest, especially in light of the fact that there had already been some media coverage of this case. But ironically, the case is now known as the Medical Council versus B. Indeed. So he's still anonymized in, in, in terms in terms of that. Okay, back shortly with Neil Maddox. At Practice Evolve, we ensure law firms have a clear pathway to the cloud while encouraging connectivity to improve overall productivity. Our focus on user competency also means law firms can discover new, innovative ways of working. We call it software with a service. Discover more today at www.practiceevolve.com. Silence in the Fifth Court. Okay, well, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the studio Neil Maddox, Dr. Neil Maddox from the University of Maynooth. Neil, thanks a million for coming in to the show today. Uh, thanks for having me, Peter. We were old colleagues. We were in college together many moons ago. Many years ago. And I have to point out, you are the original of the species. You are the Neil Armstrong of law in <laughs> Maynooth. Weren't you the very first law uh, lecturer to be employed by that august institution? We started law in Maynooth uh, in 07 with me, yeah. And uh, we have... I you think, on, your, on your lonesome. On my lonesome, but there's, uh, there's over 40 of us now. So yeah, it was a huge yeah, faculty now, a thriving now, yeah. faculty. But how did uh, that happen? Will you, will you go back to that? Because um, it is really kind of curious. Uh, John John Hughes, who was the president at the time in Maynooth, uh, had an idea to uh, to create a law uh, department with the business department as well at the time. So um, I was uh, practicing at the bar at the time and they needed someone to design the uh, programs and to deal with the professional society. So I was delighted to, to have the job. I'm still there. Yes. Uh, but it's a very different beast to, so, to so when they, I started. they built a faculty around you, Neil. Ah, well, I wouldn't say that, Peter. No. Wow. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And, but like, when did you, when did it sort of start properly, the, the, the faculty takes, in Maynooth? Because it it's takes, a thriving faculty. It's a wonderful, wonderful legal faculty. Uh, it, uh, well, John Hughes said to me at the time, actually, it takes about 10 years to build um, a department. And we're there, got 15, 16 years now. So it takes kind of uh, about that time for things to settle in, for programs to settle in, to get postgraduate students and PhD students. So uh, we're well bedded in at this stage. And we're really kind of well bedded in as part of the legal landscape uh, in Ireland as well. And I'm feeling my age now when I see former students of mine in Maynooth um, going down to the bar or attending on me in cases uh, as, as solicitors as well. It, isn't, it, isn't it wonderful? Uh, and how many students are there in the faculty now? Ooh, I I don't know the exact figure, but I think we might be the biggest, uh, I think maybe UCD between ourselves and UCD. So we wow. were we, 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 we fair, fairly... So fair from a standing start, that's, yeah. that's, that's an incredible story. Yeah. Well, look, we asked you to come in today and we were talking about the law and vaccination. That's kind of a, a niche topic. It's one that you've taken to with gusto in your lectures in Maynooth and I know you've published widely in relation to it. Why, why uh, vaccination and the law? Obviously, we all know about the COVID pandemic and the requirement for vaccinations, but why is that of interest to you, Neil? Well, I developed a module, uh, Law and Biotechnology, uh, in Maynooth and the first lecture uh, pre-COVID was on vaccination uh, and then COVID hit 
And um, there's obviously been a huge amount of uh, debate about this and uh, there's been a certain political movement, you know, pushing against vaccination. Uh, but there's been very little uh, talk of what the, the law actually um, is. You know, we've, we've had this issue for over 100 uh, years and we've been dealing with um, the legality of vaccination since the 19th century um, when, when vaccination uh, for smallpox was uh, made compulsory in places like the UK and the United States. Um, so it's a lot of the same issues that we were dealing with 100 years ago have reared their head again and became very topical uh, just as I was teaching it by uh, by coincidence. Okay, and so when the, the smallpox vaccination, which was the original of the species, came mm. in, there was pushback, there was anti-vax, there were protests? Yeah, the, 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 all, all, all of this repeated. Um, so in the sense that uh, there was an anti-vaccination movement um, uh, in the 19th century uh, in the United Kingdom. And much like today, it kind of attracted people who were just simply opposed to vaccination, but also uh, civil libertarians uh, kind of came on board as well, uh, feeling that uh, vaccination shouldn't be compulsory. So you're seeing the same uh, trends in society, um, you know, uh, in history, as we've seen uh, very recently with COVID and the vaccination issue. Okay, well, we know you have a constitutional right to bodily integrity and uh, people can say no, and that's that's part of our democratic right. Uh, it, in terms of vaccination, what are the constitutional issues that arise? Um, well, the law is very clear and the, the, one of the first decisions was from the American Supreme Court back at the start of the, uh, the, tw the 20th century and um, the European Court of Human Rights has, has, uh, has, has uh, gave a decision on this recently in a case involving the Czech Republic uh, that the state can mandate uh, compulsory vaccination. So um, not, not in the sense of um, making it obligatory, uh, you know, or, or, or holding you down, for instance, to administer a vaccine, but rather a, a, a vaccine refusal um, can be fined or can be subject to, to criminal penalty. Okay, can we go back? Can we go back to kind of a sort of a very interesting Irish type scenario, which was the Florida, Floridation uh, <coughs> case, which goes back to Limerick, isn't it? This it was is Ryan and the Attorney General. Yes, this is Ryan famous, and yeah. the Attorney General. Yeah, Can you just tell us a little bit about that? So, Ryan and the Attorney General is a very famous case in, in Irish constitutional law, obviously, because it was the first to recognise uh, unenumerated un um, rights, but people forget it was a water fluoridation uh, case. Uh, now, the argument um, that, that they made that was ultimately unsuccessful and the argument that the water fluoridation um, movement make is that it is unconsented to uh, medical uh, treatments by applying uh, fluoride uh, to water. So it's not an argument uh, that has been um, successful, but you can see um, in that case, which ultimately uh, re re recognise that we could have unenumerated rights, the potential to challenge um, uh, compulsory vaccination on constitutional, on human rights uh, grounds. And I suppose the issue there is, I mean, the belief in that case was that um, although fluoride was believed to be, uh, and I think it's established to be very good for your teeth, there was certainly a belief on their part that it might be in some way, in some ways otherwise damaging. The fluoride obviously in large quantities is poisonous, so the, the concern was that the, um, the, 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 they were being given a, a medicine that might in theory have some kind of side effect. And presumably the same issues arise in relation to, to vaccines, that certainly there are people who believe that they've been damaged by vaccines, that vaccines have side effects and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so people are being effectively forced to, it, if, if there were compulsory vaccination, they would be, they're effectively being forced to accept medical treatment that they don't want to accept. Yeah, if that's, that's precisely it. So there's, you know, always going to be a debate about vaccine safety, sure. which we won't get into here today. Um, and there's always those arguments uh, about harm, but it's also an issue of consent, really. I mean, even if if uh, they are wrong on the issue of vaccine safety, that you have to consent to medical treatment. I mean, we've moved uh, in, in the West, in legal culture in the West in the last 50 years from a paternalistic kind of view of, 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 of me 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 medical treatment to... Um, the, this huge concept of consent, this this focus on the individual and their aut autonomy and their right once they have capacity to refuse medical treatment, even if it's a very bad um, idea. And and this was uh, the issue with vaccination. Now, the way we did it here and the way it was done in Western society in the United States was, you know, they didn't mandate, the, you know, compel you to, to, to have your bodily integrity um, compromised, but rather... Um, 
if you refused vaccination, uh, you know, your movements were restricted. Uh, you couldn't go to restaurants and bars. And there's an argument uh, that one of my students actually in the class made. He said, well, at, at what point does this undermine the principle that medical treatment should be freely consented to? At what point of coercion does it become illegitimate? And are we really undermining a person's autonomy to make these decisions that the law said that they should be empowered to make for themselves? Sure. And, I mean, and tell us about that debate. I mean, so so what happens? I mean, there is competing interest there. You have the state which is saying in, in the public interest, in the public good, it is important that these dangerous diseases are kept at, in abeyance, yeah. are reduced, or the, the threat to society. So we need to implement kind of measures whereby people will buy into that. But on the other hand, you have people saying, no, sorry, uh, I don't interfere with my right not to take something if I don't want to. Yeah, and the the ethical issue really is that it's not just uh, you who is affected, so that if you fa- refuse vaccination, it leads to disease outbreak and um, it leads to a public health issue. So the justification for interfering with your rights, of course, is is for that reason, because your your refusal, your private medical decision can have an impact uh, upon the broader society on others. Now, with the recent debate about the, did they overpromise on vaccines about preventing transmission, the anti-vax movement would say, well, hold on, if they don't prevent transmission, I mean, how do you ethically justify um, making vaccination um, compulsory? So um, that's that's where that is essentially um, coming from. But um, the, the problem with this, of course, is eating bread is soon forgotten. So when the disease starts to disappear, the focus is on the vaccine. And um, if people are focused on the safety aspects of the vaccine, even if if um, it is a substantial good. And uh, you saw this even pre-COVID, you have, you have um, uh, outbreaks of measles, for instance, in large parts of the United States where there's very low vaccine uptake because of this. Hmm. I mean, I suppose one of the things that surprised me about the, the, the vaccination search that we were all asked to show on the way into bars and restaurants and that kind of thing was that once they scanned your search, they seem to have an awful lot of information about you, you know, that, that you, you know, whereas otherwise you'd normally go into a pub and if you paid with cash, there was no reason why the publican should know who you were. Suddenly, if you were flashing your vaccination cert, they, they would scan it and they'd, they'd greet you by name. That they, You know, there was clearly, that, that, that there was a whole GDPR issue, it seemed to me, that, that, that arose that, uh, as with all of these things, I, I never really sought to question at the time, but I was surprised that that b- became, became an acceptable practice, that suddenly, you, you know, y- y- your private information was known to sort of ordinary people generally in relation to whether or not you've been vaccinated. Yeah, and it was a most extraordinary time. I think we're all just trying to forget at the moment. Uh, Lord Sumption, uh, the retired uh, UK Supreme Court judge, has written on the civil liberties issues uh, that occurred in COVID in, in the UK. And I was, I'm, I'm a lawyer, I was, I was uh, uh, very surprised the speed at which um, uh, these measures were adopted. And there were very severe curtailment um, of uh, civil liberties. Now, it, in reality, the government was responding to popular demand, uh, but it was, from that point of view, very um, concerning. And um, I think it was concerning if you're if 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 you are interested in um, preserving civil liberties. It was concerning for me to see that the state could see how easily um, that this coercion could be implemented um, mm. by by law. Um, the Supreme Court. In the um, in the recent uh, uh, John Waters litigation, uh, if you read the dissent of uh, of Judge Hogan, he he kind of seems to suggest in a very indirect way that if the the subsequent lockdowns had been challenged, um, that they might have been vulnerable as as, as you know, got got in trouble on constitutional grounds because, um, you know, at, at at that point, not the first lockdown when we didn't know what the disease was, but during subsequent lockdowns when we had more information, uh, there is a legal argument you could make that some of the measures adopted uh, were illegitimate, um, and the group advising the government didn't have any lawyers sitting on it, and this was pointed out by the Supreme Court um, in in the judgment. So, um, really, you you would have they would have benefited from having that. Kind Kind of scrutiny or having even someone as part of their own panel advising them on the legal implications. But no one seemed to, to be too worried about it at the time. And it does, you're right, create um, a precedent that maybe is not a healthy precedent. And as you say, in, in circumstances where the it seemed fairly clear quite quickly that the vaccine didn't prevent uh, transmission of COVID or, mm-hmm. you know, it may have reduced it to a certain extent. But people who were vaccinated not only got COVID but continued to spread COVID, um, albeit that the symptoms seem to have been reduced. The the, the justification for the limitations seemed to be kind of 
uh, questionable, at least. Questionable. But, I mean, we shouldn't lose sight, in fairness to, to, the, to, to the state. I mean, they're looking at it in, a, in an epidemiological way. Of course they are. And they're saying, well, you know, you know, it's not said, a politician wouldn't say it, it'd be, they'd lose their shirt. But it's not said. But the reality is all vaccines um, will harm healthy people. But it's such a small percentage um, that the justification is uh, that uh, the, the lives that are saved vastly outweigh um, the small amount of damage that is done by vaccine harm. So, so when you say all vaccines will harm healthy people, I mean, you mean there's a small number of people who will have yeah. an adverse reaction to Exactly, vaccines. and yeah. it's usually considered statistically negligible. So obviously yeah. when, when something bad happens, it's reported everywhere and perhaps maybe an outsized, uh, it's given an outsized importance. Sure. But in statistical terms, um, the, the justification for it is it is saving far more lives um, than, than it is harming. Yeah. Okay, and and the the litigator in me is just picking up on that nail a little bit because obviously certain people will react negatively to vaccines. Yeah. So what happens there? Where is legal liability in such situations where uh, it is a, it is a, a, an enterprise of public health and trying to improve the public mood, but always with the possibility that something will grow, go wrong, at kind of at a marginal level. But what happens if you are somebody who's vulnerable to one of these vaccines and you've suffered, you know, a medical injury as a result? I think, I think, I, I, I could be wrong on this, that the state has granted an indemnity to the companies. So they're indemnified in respect of these claims. Um, and uh, I, we're getting beyond my expertise. And I'm not sure the political reason um, for that. So, I mean, we, we're down the law library together. We certainly hear uh, the talk of vaccine cases coming down the line um, for, for harm as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to see personal injuries cases in the next uh, couple of years. So I think I'm right in saying in the US they have a vaccine compensation board for specifically for people who have had adverse reactions to vaccines and presumably the purpose of that is that that you know that, that if the uh, the greater good is considered to be to vaccinate everybody that then if the small number of people who suffer an adverse reaction then get compensated. And you'd um, bear in mind uh, that this was a mass vaccination program you, yeah. in terms of vaccine it was it was it was extraordinary the, like the number of people in the state who took the vaccine like you know it was goes into the, the millions. So I would be very surprised if even if there was a negligible percentage of uh, vaccine harm, there wasn't a, a fair few cases that came out of it, you know. Yes. OK. I mean, it's, it's, it was almost a century, I think, since the Spanish flu, which is the equivalent sort of national impact hmm. of, of a disease like this, where, where the state went into sort of lockdown in order to counteract that. Uh, just listening to you again, Neil, I find this really, really interesting. Are, are we saying that in terms of lockdown generally, more broaden it outside of just vaccination, hmm. um, that a kind of a body of jurisprudence is, is, is emerging whereby if there is a further lockdown down the line, that people will be able to maybe challenge that and say that the implications for me are disproportionate to the interests of public health? I, I don't think I, I could put it in, in, in those terms. The tragedy of the Waters cases, I think if they had um, focused uh, on, on, on maybe their better points and if they'd taken the offer um, of free representation um, uh, that was given to them in the Supreme Court, they, they may have had a chance to, to frame a case in a way that would have been successful. Uh, I don't see any, any other cases on, on that issue coming um, down the line. Uh, and Judge Hogan, was it, it was a dissenting judgment in which he, he wrote of, of those concerns. And it was also an argument of his own rather than an argument they had made, I yeah. seem to remember. Yeah, so no, I would agree with them, but I don't know how influential it would be with his colleagues, but we just we, we simply uh, don't know. And it's a pity that there, there wasn't maybe w another case which was properly... Um, pro properly argued uh, to, to, to test these issues and let the Supreme Court, um, uh, you know, maybe guide the state as to what it got wrong and what it didn't. Internationally, I mean, we're talking about maybe the John Waters case and yeah. he's a certain type of individual who, you know, stands up to the state for better or worse. Um, but internationally, was there much kind of jurisprudence in this area? Did you see cases, <clears throat> you, you talked about European law, you took, talked about the states, but I, I, it didn't filter back to me. Now, I wouldn't be in yeah. tune as well as you are, Neil, but has there been much international jurisprudence in this area? Um, the, the European Court of Human Rights has, has, has given a judgment recently on, uh, on um, the tuber tuberculosis vaccinations and has uh, said that they, it's essentially um, uh, once it's done pursuant to law, um, that there there is uh, you know it's, it's it's lawful. So once uh, once the vaccination program is introduced and done pursuant to law, um, it's lawful. They did note that if um, you were forcing people to take the vaccine, uh, that this would narrow the margin of appreciation in subsequent cases. But they're saying exactly the same. 
um, as the American Supreme Court have said, that it is clearly within um, the public health power of states to, to regulate um, uh, vaccination. Um, but we haven't had really severe restrictions on, on liberty, as maybe you've seen on, in, in the past. I think the more severe restriction on someone's liberty for failure to vaccinate, you're getting into an area where there might be a potential challenge on maybe Article 8 of the European uh, Convention or on, under um, sure. right to liberty in, in, in various constitutional documents. You started by talking about compulsory vaccination. I mean, uh, is, is there, are there any vaccinations that are compulsory per se in the sense that you can actually um, be prosecuted for not being vaccinated and for not vaccinating your children? Or is it just sort of uh, over, the overwhelming sort of um, enthusiasm of the state, should we say, to, to in, encourage everybody to, to, to be vaccinated? Uh, not anymore. That was the, the original, the, the 19th century vaccination programs did, did result in people being imprisoned, but it usually fell disproportionately on the working classes and on ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. um, so it was regarded, uh, they did a law commission afterwards, they regarded this as on as unfair. Um, not not now, but one of the ways in which it's affected is entrance to schools, for instance. So schools will exclude, if you, refu if you refuse to get your children a measles vaccine um, or a smallpox vaccine or something like that, schools are justified in excluding you sure. um, until you have the vaccine. Um, there's also the issue of... And where's that covered in law? Where, where is that provided for in law, Neil? Ooh, that is a good one. Or is that just me. a legal precedent? <laughs> That's just established, um, okay, in it, terms yeah. of court, court well, rulings? If you were looking in terms of justification, um, obviously children coming, unvaccinated children spreading disease in the school impacts upon the other children. So I think in, in, in a pure, for what I reason from first principles, it's obviously yes. fair okay, and fair justified. Um, there's also the question of exemptions. Um, uh, so clearly, if you have a medical issue and you can't get vaccinated, that's unquestioned. But um, there's also a big debate about um, conscientious objection and should conscientious objection uh, be allowed. In practical terms, if you make it too easy for people to, uh, to make a conscientious objection, it reduces vaccine uptake. Mm -hmm. So if you put barriers in their way um, to it, you know, even if you create administrative burdens on them um, and you make it hard to be a conscientious objector, it tends to lead to higher uh, vaccine uptake as well. So there's a little bit of practical policy in it as well. Neil, this has been absolutely fascinating. It's, it's very niche and it's kind of something I didn't really think about, but you've you've really illuminated it for me. Please God, we don't have another lockdown. We don't have another COVID-like pandemic where we're all affected so dramatically for such a long period of time. But if it does happen again, I do think lessons will be learned and we'll see a bit more court action emerging from it. Now, now to the, the, the questions that we have to ask Mark, our, our concluding questions. Do you have any book or film or other work of art you'd like to recommend either to your colleagues in the law library or to law students or indeed your own law students? Um, I think uh, there's a film uh, with John Travolta, A Civil Action, um, which uh, is it's an American movie, but it is the uh, most accurate portrayal of what it is to work as a litigator, I would say. And it's, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's very, very well done. And Robert Duvall plays a kind of old, wizened, streetwise lawyer in it. And uh, any law student would be, would, be, would be wise to to see his approach to how he does things. You, you feel it's a fair warning for anybody who who, who <laughs> that again, Neil, class action, a, a civil action, a civil, a civil action. action, a civil action, a civil action. Yeah. Okay, the great John Travolta. Is this pre Pulp Fiction or post? Pulp Fiction. Post Pulp Fiction, but not by that much. I think. Okay, so yeah. that was just uh, the period. And any books that appeal to you on your on your shelf? Are there any kind of legal books that you kind of novels or anything with a legal theme that you've come across? I know you're big into property law as well. Uh, <laughs> maybe that brings in Jane Austen and all these sort of people. Well, on the theme we were talking about, uh, Lord Sumption has a collection of essays around uh, COVID, which is a nice light read on on the issues we were talking about. If anyone was interested. I, I but writings by Lord Sumption are a light read, are they? Um, yeah, I, I think he I'm writes sorry, well. Judges scared. can write well. Oh, Just no, some I, of them, I, not I, all I, of them. I, I, I've only read his judgments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Neil. So, Neil Maddox, Dr. Neil Maddox of Maynooth University, thank you so much for coming in and being a guest on The Fifth Court. At Practice Evolve, we ensure law firms have a clear pathway to the cloud while encouraging connectivity to improve overall productivity. Our focus on user competency also means law firms can discover new, innovative ways of working. We call it software with a service. Discover more today at www.practiceevolve.com. The Fifth Court will adjourn until next week.
And that's all from this edition of The Fifth Court. We hope you have enjoyed it. Can we say a huge thank you to our guest, Dr. Neil Maddox of Maynooth University for coming in and telling us about the law and vaccination. Really, really interesting discussion there. Uh, I would also like to say a big thank you to our producer, Cunnell O'Moroyne, and to the Dublin South podcast studios and Peter Rice in particular for recording this show and doing such a wonderful job. Mark, we can't go without saying thank you to our sponsor. Absolutely. We need to thank Practice Evolved Software Software who combine document management and accounting software and offer law firms a holistic practice management solution built with lawyers in mind. So thank you very much to them. Very good. Uh, if you have any comments or any legal stories you would like to raise with us, please contact us on our website or on LinkedIn. Uh, and please share this podcast, Mark. I think we were forgetting to say that. Absolutely. I think uh, we were number eight in the business eight? podcast. Okay, chart. Well, you're really studying checked. the exactly, form. Yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. So for me, Peter Leonard. And myself, Mark Tottenham. Thank you for listening and we'll see you soon in the Fifth Court.